The refugee process, first let's, let's look at who is a refugee. A refugee is someone who flees his or her country because of persecution, because of violence, and because of war. The United States of America has the strongest vetting process in the world. I will give you an insight of that process, the process I went through. When an individual flees his country, he, goes, he or she goes to another country. That country is considered the secondary country. When they get into the secondary country, they will have to register with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, UNHCR. When they register with the UN, the UN will have to obtain all the identifying biometrics. The UN will get the biodata, the UN will interview them, and of all the refugees that will go through that process, less than 1% will come to the United States. Lucky me. And only the strongest applicants will move forward to the various agencies of the United States government. Those agencies are the National Counterterrorism Center. That's the first agency the refugee will go and get interviewed by the officials of that center. They are specific to the area. All the inquiries, all the interviews will be specific to that area. Should they, move, should they pass the screening, they'll move to the FBI. The FBI will also be very specific. And if they're lucky and go beyond that, they go over to the Department of Homeland Security. They will also do their screenings, their interviews, their biometrics, their data, whatever it is. After Homeland Security, they will go to the State Department. The State Department will conduct their interviews and their ch security checks. After the State Department, you go back to the Homeland Security, but this time you'll be interviewing with USCIS, United States Immigration Services. And they will interview you and go through their security checks. And if you're lucky, then you go through medical. And it's grueling. After medical, you go through what we call the cultural orientation. That is, you're almost there. You're almost able to come to the United States. This process can take anywhere from 18 months to two decades. After you go through the cultural orientation, you have a final screening to go through. And prior to coming to the U.S., that final screening will, go, will be done, will be conducted by the U.S. Custom and Border Protection National Targeting Center. What is that? Have you all heard about it? Yeah. Refugees will have to go through that. After all of that, I'll be honest with you, with all the cultural orientation and all... It never prepared me for coming to Montana. <laughs> it never did. Because I came here in February. <laughs> February 17 will make me 23 years here. Thank you. All of those, the screening processes I just mentioned happen outside of the U.S., in that secondary country that you fled to. 
So none of it happens within here. So it took me two years and seven months to go through my process. And I thought that was terrible. I thought that was wrong. They kept me away from my family for two years and seven months. But guess what? That was nothing. I just learned of another guy who started the process at age 17. He finally came to the U.S. last year at age 34. Do you want to talk about extreme vetting? 17 years of vetting? Which one of you are ready to go through that process? There are other programs in the U.S. that, that we should be focusing on. Instead, we don't. We focus only on, and it's been, I don't know why it's been this way, but there isn't any evidence of refugees committing terrorism. Not one. Not in the U.S. Whenever you hear people talk about terrorism and refugee, they will always give you an example of where? Europe. The U.S. is not Europe. The U.S. has her own screening process, vetting process, that she puts her people through. Europe has their own. There are several myths that we go through, you know, I hear all the time. One of them is refugees don't pay taxes. Are you telling me I lived in Montana for 23 years and didn't pay taxes? They pay taxes. <laughs> refugees take jobs from U.S. workers. Is that real? Did I take anybody's job? Since I've been in this country for 23 years, I've never had less than two jobs. That means there, there are lots of jobs for everybody. <laughs> Refugees <laughs> receive special money from the U.S. government to purchase homes and cars and all that. Where is mine? <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for mine for 23 years. When I fled, when we fled Liberia into uh, Montana, two weeks later, I started my first job with Inner Mountain Children's Home. I didn't even have time to get my feet wet. I was up and moving. And my situation is not unique. Another one is the refugees come to the U.S. for economic reasons. No. What did I say about the definition of a refugee? The first thing on their mind is safety. They are fleeing for safety. Not to get rich. When I fled Liberia, 1994, when I entered this country and arrived at JFK Airport, I had 25 cents in my pocket. It wasn't enough for a phone call. I couldn't even call my wife to tell her, hey, I'm in America. So no, if we were here for economic reasons, I'm supposed to be rich right now because I've been here 23 years. What am I waiting on? <laughs> Refugees do not contribute or participate in the communities. Where am I today? Is this not part of my community, Grand Street? Is TEDx not part of my community? Am I not participating? We do all of those things. And of course, refugees present health risk. After going through the health screening, <laughs> you don't want to know what we go through. Every part of you is screened. <laughs> Look, I'm from a country, Liberia. Liberia is a small West African country. It was established by slaves that were free from this country and sent back to Africa. When the slaves got there, they formed a government. They uh, took with them what they had learned here. And they were so honored by going back to Africa, they decided to honor one person. 
they honored your fifth, our fifth president. Who was he? Monroe. They named that capital city after Monroe because he was instrumental in sending the slaves back to Africa. We have places in Liberia. I'm from Maryland in Liberia. I went to school in Virginia. We have Louisiana, Georgia, Mississippi. Those were places the slaves lived. And when they went back, they named places like that. But I'm sure some of you have heard of Charles Taylor and Samuel Doe. We, when we fled Liberia, we fled because of one of Africa's most brutal civil war. When I finally, my wife and I finally fled the country, I was 90 pounds, she was 87. We were dying of starvation. We weren't looking to seek economic wealth. We weren't thinking about terrorism. All we were thinking about survival. The secondary country we went to was Ghana. When we got into Ghana, my wife said, hey, I got family in Montana. I said, where is that? <laughs> she said, oh, it's in America. I said, uh -huh, I know America. No, Montana ain't America. <laughs> she, said, she said, oh, yes, I do. And she called her. My wife was an exchange student, and she went to Helena High, and she lived with her family. And she called the family out and told them we fled the country and we were in Ghana and we were seeking help. Of course, they were excited. We will get you all over here soon. Don't worry. It was easy for my wife because all they did was they went to Carroll and Carroll College awarded her a scholarship to do nursing. So boom, she came to Montana. Not me. I had to go through that process. And that process was grueling. In fact, when I got to the fifth step, I called my wife and said, I'm done. These people will never let me get in. Don't worry about it. Let's forget it. I'll stay here. You stay there. It's over. And she said, she gave me, after I told her such a speech, I mean, after I made such a speech and told her, I'm done, this, she gave me one line. They know what they're doing. Be calm. They know what they're doing. And I'm like, what? That process took two years and seven months. When I was finally cleared after I went through the Border Custom Targeting Center, I called them up and said, I'm coming. Tell me about Montana. And my wife said, oh, it's nice. You will love it. It's pretty warm today in February. I said, what's the temperature? She said, oh, it's 29 degrees. I said, but water freezes at 32, so how can it be 29? <laughs> and she said, but, yeah, that's, I said, no, you don't understand it. Let me talk to someone who understands the temperature. <laughs> and she calls her host mom, and she comes, up, hi, Wilma, how are you? You'll soon be here. I said, yes. I said, what's the temperature? She said, oh, it's 29. It's very warm today. <laughs> I said, what is it when it's cold? She said, oh, 30 below. I said, below what? <laughs> she said, below zero. Now, imagine I'm coming from a country. The average temperature is 80 degrees. And they're telling me it's warm at 29. <laughs> it gets cold at 30 below. And I went through that cultural center, and they never told me about that. <laughs> so the crazy thing, I had a sister here, and I called her and told her, I'm coming to America. She said, okay, I'll meet you at JFK. Whatever I bring, you wear it all. You're going to Montana, you wear it. Okay. She brought two sets of long johns a turtleneck, a winter jacket, everything. What she didn't tell me, I had to go through the airports. I had to be on the plane and everything. That night, 
I put on two sets of long, I mean, I'm mourning. Put on two sets of long john. Put on my tartar neck. Put on the vest. And then I got on the plane. And I'm the only one sweating. <laughs> I am the only one sweating. And the guy next to me is looking at me like, what the heck is going on? So, of course, I took off my first layer. Took off the second, and he turned. How many layers are you wearing? <laughs> you don't want to know, man. <laughs> and then I, when we were landing, descending into Helena, the pilot said, it's sunny and warm at 32 degrees. And I'm like, these guys are crazy in this place. <laughs> what piqued my interest the most was the fact when I got down, I actually saw people in shorts. <laughs> At 32 degrees, people were wearing shorts. Ladies and gentlemen, the process we have in place works. The process we have in place is extreme. It took me two years and seven months. It took the other guy 17 years. And there isn't any evidence of terrorism from refugees. You make your own conclusions. Thanks for having me.